So welcome to everybody. My name is uh, Mathilde Pruvot and I work to the communication department of the entrepreneurship and innovation direction of Ecole Polytechnique and I'm in charge of events organization. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome to the ninth edition of our international CEO talk, uh, Luca Mendes, uh, who is co-founder of Revelo. And uh, so many thanks, uh, Luca. Uh, so Luca is uh, live from Sao Paulo, and we will uh, present. Uh, he will present his experiences and his entrepreneurial path, exchanging with us for the next hour. So many thanks to you. And before Luca starts his presentation, I'll leave the floor to my colleague Roberta Camera, who is in charge of the uh, ICSAP incubator program of uh, the Ecole Polytechnique. Thank you, uh, Roberta. Thank you, Mathilde, and welcome to everybody to this uh, CEO International talk. Uh, we are very glad to host today Lukas. And uh, just a few words on this event. We have been designed this event, the CEO talk, uh, in order to let our startup discover some inspiring entrepreneurial stories uh, from other entrepreneurs uh, who launched their startup abroad and they're coming like Lukas from the X uh, uh, ecosystem, let's say. And this is an event uh, not open only uh, to the startups incubated here at the Ecole Polytechnique, but for everyone who is interested in innovation and uh, entrepre entrepreneurship. Uh, let's just uh, me give you some few words on our incubation program for people who don't know it. Uh, ICSAP uh, is uh, the program uh, for, of the Ecole Polytechnique uh, for deep tech early stage startup who would like to uh, develop their enterprise. enterprise. And uh, uh, generally we uh, host a, a small group of startup and we follow them during six months in order to uh, support them to launch their product on the market. So um, thank you uh, again, uh, Lucas, for your participation. Before giving you the floor, I think that Matilda would like just to uh, provide some uh, information on how it's possible to interact with you today on the chat. And so I let Matilda explain how to do. Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Yes, for so for you, uh, Adrian. So once Luca ends uh, his presentation, we will, we will start the uh, question and answer session. And you are very welcome to write your question in English or in or in French into the chat uh, just uh, on the screen below. And we'll be very glad to uh, reply to all, to all of you. So thank you very much. So Luca, it's your uh, turn and. Uh, Let's uh, us uh, discover your, your profile. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, Matilda. Thank you, uh, Roberta, uh, for the very nice words and the introduction. I'd like to start by apologizing to um, everyone who is listening to this uh, Polytechnician uh, speak English. Uh, unfortunately, it has been many years since I've not used uh, French couramment. Uh, 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 so um, you'll have to bear with my my uh, English stick. Um, uh, so I'll start uh, with a little bit of my background and then talk a little bit about my, about my company, Ravello. Um, I'm Brazilian. I was born uh, in Brazil. Uh, I lived here um, all my life until um, I went to college here uh, at the University of Sao Paulo at the engineering school, at the Polytechnic, Polytechnic School of the, of, uh, the University of Sao Paulo. They had... Um, a double degree uh, program with uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, in Paris. And uh, uh, I was very interested by that program as soon as I, um, I was admitted into the school. I learned about it um, and I passed the uh, concours uh, as, a, as an élève voie deux uh, uh, international and got admitted into uh, um, the, um, the, the Cycle Ingénieur Polytechnicien uh, of Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, I was uh, part of the promo uh, X2003, Chica La Jaune, and I was uh, during two years um, at the at the plateau, um, uh, part of the, the section tennis. Uh, I had made some of my very uh, best friends uh, during my time at, at Polytechnique, um, and and I believe that that uh, 
provided me with a solid technical uh, and scientific background that was useful throughout my life as a, as a professional. Uh, after um, completing my studies at Polytechnique, I went to, uh, uh, I came back to Brazil and I did my école d'application, uh, my, my, my fourth year, my quatrième année at the uh, University of Sao Paulo. Um, I finished that uh, program uh, and so, as many uh, colleagues of Polytechnique do, uh, I went into the financial markets. I started my career at Goldman Sachs as an M&A banker, uh, and I stayed, stayed there for over one year. Um, discovering what I liked and what I didn't like, I, I soon found out that banking was not for me. Um, and um, so I quickly moved into something else. I moved into uh, uh, consulting, uh, and I stayed at Bain & Company as a, st a strategy consultant for, uh, for three years, uh, but based, based mostly uh, out of Brazil. Um, at that time, I decided to start my first business. Um, my first business was uh, a business in the sector of cosmetics. I was selling beauty products online. Um, and believe it or not, I was selling hair care products online. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, that first experience taught me a lot about what it takes to be prepared to start a company. My company went almost broke uh, in six months time. And if it weren't for a merger with another, another company, we would not have survived. Um, that company, uh, the resulting company of the merger, went on to have a lot of success. Uh, we raised over $30 million in venture capital um, and went, uh, uh, um, and then we're, we're so, we sold to a strategic player uh, in Brazil. Uh, I made my exit from that company and went to business school. Um, for two years, I lived in Palo Alto, California um, uh, at the University of Stanford uh, where I, I did my MBA. Um, and that's where I met with my co-founder, Lachlan, who is uh, Australian, but had been living in uh, Latin America uh, for, for almost five years then. Um, and we decided to start something together. Uh, that something is now Ravello. Uh, and Ravello is a marketplace for tech workers from uh, emerging markets to find job opportunities in the US and Europe. Um, today, uh, we have uh, over 200 employees. Uh, we've served uh, over 20,000 companies um, and we have over 1.5 million candidates uh, in our system. 80% um, of our sales are coming from the United States, but a lot of the sales also come from uh, Europe and from Latin America as well. Um, the idea behind Ravello was that we were able to use technology to digitize a problem, a very basic problem of connecting candidates and companies um, in a region that did not have a digital solution for that. Um, so whereas in France, you have had um, job boards for a long time, uh, like Pôle emploi and, and uh, other, uh, other digital solutions, uh, those solutions did not exist uh, in Latin America. Uh, and where, and Latin America is also a place where global solutions like LinkedIn failed. Um, well, LinkedIn is a global solution. Everybody's on LinkedIn, uh, everybody's able to connect on LinkedIn. And that's exactly the problem. If you post a job for a data scientist uh, on LinkedIn in Brazil or in Mexico, you will find and you will be flooded with thousands of um, resumes of CVs that are not qualified for the job. So you find yourself with the opposite problem. You have an overabundance of profiles that are not qualified. So you, you end up having a lot of trouble sifting through and filtering through those profiles, um, which essentially renders LinkedIn as a tool useless uh, to a recruiter. Um, because of that, in Latin America, a lot of uh, the recruiting work is done offline. 95% uh, of positions are filled uh, by offline headhunters and offline recruiters. And that's the solution that we wanted to digitize to create that, um, that liquid marketplace. Uh, we started as a LATAM to LATAM company. Uh, we were serving Latin American companies with Latin American candidates. And that marketplace started gaining liquidity. And once that began to grow, uh, we started being uh, um, uh, 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 sought, sought after by, by US and European companies. 
uh, that we're looking for remote workers um, to, to uh, add to their teams. The growth was ex uh, very, very fast and accelerated by, um, by COVID uh, because in, during COVID times, everybody started working remotely. Um, uh, remote work was normalized. So companies in the US and Europe started looking for more and more um, uh, uh, employees from other parts of the world uh, to augment their teams. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we're uh, close to 200 um, employees now. We've raised over $20 million in venture capital over three rounds. Uh, and we've been growing at triple digits, meaning north of, uh, of 100% for the past five years. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll keep it short. I'll, I'll, I'll finish my, my intro like that. Uh, feel free to send me questions over the, the Q&A. I know that Mathilde has a long list of questions for me, so let's 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 dig into it. Yeah, Roberta too. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We yes. we're, we're very inspired Thank by you. your story, Lucas. So yes. we have a lot of questions for you. And uh, if you agree, Mathilde, I would like just to ask the first question. Yes. Uh, you have a very inter interesting path and uh, a lot of experience to share. So. Uh, did you found some inspiration from other uh, entrepreneurs or mentors and uh, how they, did they help you during your, uh, co the construction of your startup? Yeah, so I think the biggest inspiration to, to start uh, Ravello and to become an entrepreneur was, uh, came from my family. So when, when I was um, seven years old, uh, my parents moved from um, the from Sao Paulo, which is a large uh, uh, city in, in Brazil, uh, to the countryside of Brazil. There I grew up in a city of about 30,000 um, inhabitants, uh, and I lived there for 12 years. Uh, that's where I went to uh, um, elementary school, middle school, uh, secondary school. Um, and, and it was interesting because um, it was a city that did not have any infrastructure. So there were no good schools, there were no like, cinemas, there were no sports clubs. There was, uh, it was very, very um, lacking in infrastructure. And what my parents did was they mobilized the community to create that infrastructure. So they mobilized the community of, par of parents to create a very good uh, school for the children of that uh, town. Um, and uh, when there was no, there, there were no clubs, they mobilized a group of, of, of people and created a tennis club or, uh, or a, a sports center. Um, and I think the inspiration came from the fact that if you don't like reality as it is, um, as an entrepreneur, you have the power to change it. Uh, and and I, I, that, that might sound like bravado, like cliche, but it's true. And I, I grew up thinking like that. If there's a problem that I, I, I you know, want to fix it. I, I just devote my time to it and my energy to it um, and to create the solution. Um, and, and that is something that I, um, that I, I, I find motivation in every day uh, in the life uh, of an entrepreneur. Um, as, uh, as I move forward, um, I think uh, uh, it, it's, I've had, um, I've had the luck of having incredible mentors uh, to tackle very specific problems like oh, fundraising. There's one person that I go to uh, or you know, people in structure, there's another person that I go to, strategy, et cetera. But, it's, um, but that driving force, uh, that driving motivation came from, from uh, my years uh, growing up in the countryside of Brazil. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just to, to talk about uh, your uh, the services you offer, uh, what is your uh, current uh, business model and uh, how it is uh, evolved uh, over time? And is it the case? Uh, is there any evolution on it or, or not from the beginning? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that I think it's very natural for business models to evolve over time. I think that we would be incompetent if uh, we had not changed our business model because it was really bad at the start, to tell you the truth. Uh, so initially what we did was charge a success fee uh, when a company hired uh, through, or through a Velo, basically like a headhunter, right? So, um, and what we found was uh, that that did not create a lot of engagement um, 
from uh, from the companies. Companies were like, yeah, I'd like to try before I, I pay and they would try it and then they would not engage. And yeah, so that, that business model did not work at all. Um, in 2017, um, we actually had a client suggest another business model for us. A client came to us and said, look, um, I want to fill not one position, but I want to fill 30 positions using your platform. And for me to make a hire and then pay a success fee and then make another hire and then pay it again, et cetera, it's going to be very complicated uh, from a internal bureaucracy standpoint. So uh, to go through procurement processes, et cetera, it's going to be very complicated. So how about I prepay all the hires and you give me a big discount? So I will pay uh, um, uh, for those 30 positions and I'll, then I'll use those credits over time to make the hires. Uh, mm -hmm. And we of course said, yes, um, who doesn't like prepaid clients, right? Uh, and, they, and then what we started doing was offering that to a lot of our clients and we saw that it worked. Um, they wanted to prepay it. And once they prepaid it, um, they were more engaged with the platform because they had already committed to the platform. So having already made the commitment, they would use the platform more often, have more success, um, and then would return to buy more. So as, as it is the case in many times in the life of an entrepreneur, the best ideas come from the clients, not from us. So, um, and it's, uh, that was one, um, uh, uh, one example. Uh, more recently, um, there, with the growth of our customer base in the US, um, our US uh, clients are also suggested that we charge a monthly fee uh, after they've made the hire. So instead of making one big payment in advance, you make one small payment in advance. And then when you are successful, you pay something every month because then you have aligned interests. As long as the candidate stays with the company, the more I get. So it's, uh, so again, uh, all, all that comes from, uh, uh, a very close interaction with uh, with the clients. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Luca. Yeah, that, that's uh, very interesting, uh, Lucas, because yeah. we, we always tell to our startup that the the, the, the client discovery it's a continued process that you have to to keep even after having launched your startup, and it's something that I see that you are applying in your daily life as entrepreneur. So yeah, they, and I think that I have other examples of that as well. So our product development roadmap is deeply inspired by experiments that we run with the clients. Uh, we're always in beta mode. There is no final version of our platform. So every version that we launch, every change that we make is continuous and it's always based on feedback from the client. Now that feedback can be explicit or it can be implicit through behavior. I can have uh, customer interviews with the clients um, and they can tell me what they want or better I can just create two versions of the platform as an A-B test and see how the two cohorts of clients perform. Um, that's something that we do on a regular basis at Ravello um, and, and I think that that never stops as, uh, as Roberta said uh, it's, it's a continuous process. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yes. And uh, uh, I just would like to come back even to what you were mentioning that in your life, apart your family, and this is a story that is really inspiring, but uh, you had even some mentors on specific topics. So how did you choose your mentor if you uh, had some, even some example for our startup that are useful in order to continue looking for the right mentors and right experts all along your uh, your your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I think um, there's a there's a saying that you are uh, you are the reflection of the five people that you interact interact with the most, right? You are everybody is a, is a reflection of the one of the people that you're surrounded with, right? So, uh, I what what we do is we're very and I say we with my co-founder we're very um, uh, uh, selective uh, and very intentional in, in choosing who we spend our time with. So uh, one of my mentors uh, is somebody who uh, was my professor at Stanford uh, and is somebody who I developed a connection with uh, during class. Um, and it was a class on entrepreneur, entrepreneurial study, studies. 
and is somebody that I can speak to about um, the hardships of being a founder. Now, I also have somebody I consider a mentor who is part of my board of directors. I cannot speak to that person about the hardships of being a founder because at the end of the day, he's on my board. He can't, I, I can't show many weaknesses to that kind of, um, not, no, to that kind of person. Uh, but that's somebody who I can speak to about fundraising uh, and who I can speak to about how to project uh, um, uh, 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 the desired image that we want as a company to project to the market. So uh, there, is n there won't be one mentor that will solve all your problems. So the way I choose it is uh, I develop a re relationship with, with people uh, over time and I see what their strong suits are uh, and if there's chemistry, of course, there's no way as forcing yourself in a, into a mentor-mentee relationship. It, it, it there needs to, it needs to flow. It needs to there needs to be chemistry. Um, so uh, when that goes uh, well, well, then then it's good for both parties. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. Mathilde, maybe you have a question for Lucas too. Yes, uh, different uh, item. It's uh, about um, uh, your uh, co-founder. Uh, could you tell about uh, your uh, the story of your uh, meeting and how do you you deal with and what is the what do you think is the receipt for a success uh, uh, association and for a solid re relationship uh, between uh, two partners. In, yeah, in that sure. uh, kind of um, uh, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, my relationship uh, with my co-founder could not be better. Um, and I've had bad relationships with co-founders in the past. So I can compare and contrast both. Um, I'll start with the way we met. Uh, we met by chance through our wives. Our wives are good friends uh, and we would interact uh, socially. Uh, when I was uh, in Palo Alto, his wife was living in uh, Berkeley, which is very close by and he would fly in uh, to visit her. So we would interact. Um, and after a few conversations, we saw that we were looking at similar things. We were looking to start a company in Latin America. We were looking to at the same problems. We were both, we both saw that it was a big opportunity in talent and bridging, uh, the gap between talent in emerging markets and, uh, demand, uh, in Europe and the U S. Um, so we started, um, our, uh, our MVP together. Now our relationship is, um, is very solid because it's a relationship um, based on trust. Uh, I think that there's very few people that I trust more than I trust my co-founder. Um, and it's interesting because when we started, we were not friends, right? This is not somebody that I would consider, hey, he's a good friend and I'll start my, uh, my company with him. But um, there's a professor from Stanford that says that friendships built on business are stronger than businesses built on friendship. Uh, so the fact that our relationship developed into a friendship um, after so many years of working together makes our friendship stronger. Um, and and I, I, that's something that I suggest uh, to, to um, early stage entrepreneurs to look at. Um, it's not, choosing a co-founder is not a matter of affinity. It's a matter of trust. Uh, because if you don't share the same values, uh, you don't need to, to agree all the time, but your values need to be in place. You, you might disagree on strategy, you might disagree on tactics, you might disagree on objectives, but you can't disagree on values. The way you make decisions, the values that your decisions are based on need to be aligned. If they're not aligned, um, then I can speak from experience from my past startup that it will be very hard for you to have a, a productive relationship. Now, um, when I was um, thinking about starting Ravello, um, there, I was looking for a co-founder. It was, I always thought that it would be very difficult for me to start something from scratch by myself, at least at that point in my career. Um, so I, 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 I was looking for somebody to, to, to share the journey with. Um, and somebody told me that um, your co-founder is probably something, someone who you have already met. Um, it's very rare that you go out looking for a, for a co-founder 
uh, and you find, some, find something you've never met and then you become a successful co-founder. It's rare, it happens, but it's rare. Um, he was already part of my social circle. So uh, it was, he was already somebody that I knew. It was just, you build a co-founder relationship on top of an existing relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. I found that very useful. And it's something that I tell entrepreneurs today who ask me about the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, uh, Lucas, uh, I am impressed. So, because your, your experience, it's, a, it's a very rich because you have the positive side on, on this uh, current experience and the negative side in your past experience. So if you have to, and, and already you gave some suggestions, but if you have, for example, to uh, provide some suggestion on things to avoid with a co-founder, what would be your advice? Yeah, I think that the first years of the partnership are the years where you can jump ship uh, very quickly. You can abandon ship. Um, so I would, I would stay very alert at, uh, for early signs of misalignment. So if I had my time again with my previous startup, I don't think I would have stayed as long as I did because um, there were some very clear signs very early on that it would not work for us to be together. So okay. I could have decided earlier. Um, so the suggestion is don't wait too long because the longer you wait, the more, um, the higher your opportunity cost becomes um, and the more difficult it is for you to jump ship and abandon ship and start something new. Um, and believe me, it's always better to start something new than continue in a strained relationship with a co-founder, even if the business is going well for some time, because with the strained relationship, there will be a point where the business will not go well anymore. So it's, uh, that's one advice. The other advice, um, which is something I did with Locke, uh, actually was something that he proposed, and I, I think we both agree that would be the best. Um, we set up some form of test drive period. Um, it was, um, we wanted to run an MVP. We knew that we were going to build a marketplace model. We had uh, an idea of what the, the business would look like and what we would test. And we gave ourselves three months. And we said, in three months, we will know whether one, the business works or doesn't work. And two, whether the partnership works or doesn't work. Now, if the partnership doesn't work and the business doesn't work, okay, no problem. No, we're, we're splitting zero here. So it's no, uh, uh, each one can go its own, his, his own separate way and no problem. If the business succeeds and the partnership succeeds, we can decide that we want to work together. Now, if the business works and the partnership doesn't, we will become competitors. Each one will start uh, his own company and we, will, and we, had, we agreed to that. We saw these are the rules of the game. So let's see whether the MVP works out both for the product and for the relationship. And it was, uh, it was a very interesting time because uh, it was a time in which we both kept our eyes open uh, and learned um, about how it was to work together uh, in a very structured way. Mm. Super uh, interesting experience with the best drive. I just would like now to switch on your current environment, entrepreneur environment in Brazil. And if you just can a little bit uh, tell us what are, according to you, the pros and cons to be entrepreneur in Brazil. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I I'll speak about Brazil, but it, it also applies to uh, many different places in Latin America and in a, in a smaller extent to uh, many places in emerging uh, markets in general. Um, I think the big advantages of starting a business in emerging countries is that one, you have uh, much less competition than in US and Europe. Uh, and two, uh, you can make a lot of money or ha have a lot of success uh, solving really basic problems. Look, look at Ravello. Uh, we are not creating the third degree solution of an AI platform. You know, it's not, it's not something very complicated, the problem that we're solving. The platform is very robust, uh, but the problem we're solving is simple, is connecting qualified professionals with companies looking for qualified professionals. That's it, that's it. There's no, uh, 
and 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 in markets like the US or Europe it is increasingly harder for an entrepreneur to find such basic problems uh, that have not been tackled by technology before. So um, uh, you mentioned that a lot of the entrepreneurs uh, at Xup are doing are focusing on uh, deep tech solution. So there's there's no. I don't think there even is an, a deep tech ecosystem. Uh, in, uh, in entrepreneurship in Latin America because everybody's focusing on very simple things. It doesn't mean that the solutions are not complex, but the problems are simple. I think that's, a, that's beautiful because you can, you can have a more direct um, feeling for the impact that you have uh, with these fundamental problems. For example, we, when we connect somebody that lives in Brazil, Argentina, or Mexico with a job in the US or the UK or France, um, we're changing their lives. They're making a, a level of salaries that they would not be able to make otherwise. And that's very palpable. That's very solid, very tangible. Um, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's a very, um, not only a very profitable uh, 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 market, but also a market that can give you the feeling that you are creating uh, jobs and, and having a lot of impact. Now, um, there's a downside, of course. Uh, the downside being there's very little structure uh, in the market. So um, if you, uh, to, to fundraise uh, in Latin America, uh, I, I will tell you that we've probably, we probably spoke to all the funds uh, in, uh, that were relevant uh, uh, for investment in Latin America up until our Series B. Uh, so now everything from the, from then on is just repeat conversations with the same funds. So the, the capital markets are not are not very uh, deep, uh, and I think that that's a problem uh, if you want to build uh, scalable solutions. Two, as I mentioned, there's um, um, there's no market for deep tech, and I wouldn't say only deep tech. I think there's very little market for biotech. There's very little market for hardware. There's very little market for um, applied sciences uh, in general. Only, I, I think there's room for that if you go into corporate ventures and if, you're, if you find some large corporation, usually a multinational corporation with, uh, with a basis in the US or Europe that will invest in you, but there's no um, pure player investors that will, uh, will invest in these markets. So um, I, would say that, uh, I would say that those are the main disadvantages, a lack of capital and a lack of depth for, the, for deep tech uh, solutions. Mm, okay, thank you. Uh, ju just uh, for the audience, thank you very much, uh, Luca. Uh, uh, the audience, do not hesitate to to uh, to to mention your question. Huh? Uh, you're very welcome. <laughs> um, otherwise, I have a question about your recruitment because your company uh, has uh, 200 about 200 employees. So, how you manage uh, your recruitment, the, your strategy? Uh, how you deal with uh, you know, the best, best profiles uh, on the market, and uh, how do you uh, you need uh, your teams, and uh, what is your written strategy about it? I could speak for many hours about that because that's uh, uh, that's my full time job. Um, so um, I think that. Uh, being able to find the best profiles in the market um, is a relative question, right? Uh, because uh, there are companies, and for, for all uh, early stage entrepreneurs, uh, you will know that there are companies who can um, afford to pay salaries that you cannot afford, right? So that's, I think that's a difficulty that all startups face, uh, at least when they're very early stage. So you can't Maybe the best developers are working for Facebook, for Google, for um, I don't know where, and, and it's very hard to, to find them if you don't have the capital. Um, what we do is we try to find people who would come for the mission. They come for the mission of solving the problem that we are tackling. Um, and, and I think that that's something that has been working for us. Two, we are very um, generous uh, with equity when making hires. So we, um, we are not afraid of giving uh, our uh, prospective employees uh, a piece of our company 
Um, and usually that is very, um, it's very powerful because um, equity is like fuel. If you throw gas, it's like gasoline. If you throw gasoline on the floor, it does nothing. But if, if you throw gasoline on the fire, it augments the fire, right? So if, it, if you offer equity to somebody who does not have appetite to build a company together with you uh, and be part of the construction of that company, you will not, you will see that there will be no added motivation to that person, right? But if, um, if you see the motivation booming, if you see somebody really excited by the fact that they got equity, that's usually a good sign because you've, um, you've found somebody who is uh, looking to build something together with you. Uh, so I think that that's, uh, that's what we do. Uh, also, during the recruiting process, we are never afraid to use um, clients, board members, investors as part of the recruiting and selling process. Because at the end of the day, for a startup, um, uh, uh, an interview is also a sell job, right? You are also selling the dream of your startup to your prospective employee. Uh, and, and sometimes you alone are not enough to make the sale. But if you have people that you can count on, mentors, investors, board members, et cetera, that can also speak to that person and try to speak about the vision that you have for the future, um, that's something that, uh, that we usually do. Um, now that's, that's recruiting about um, uniting the teams uh, and retaining the teams. Uh, that is a question that I would answer differently um, two years ago. Uh, because what happened in 2020 uh, is that everybody went remote. Ravello went remote. We are a fully remote startup today. We uh, um, we we had an office for you know 200 people. Now we have an office for 10, 15 people for the employees that want to use that space. And it's usually empty because everybody's working from home and they don't they don't even want to use mm -hmm. that space. So how do you unite teams? Um, when you're working remotely, it's really tough. It's really difficult because you know you don't know what what people are doing and how or after they turn off from Zoom, uh, you don't know how motivated they are. You don't know how engaged they are. So what we tried doing at the very early start was dialing up, like increasing a little bit the level of structure and control over routines that we have. At the very start, um, it sounded a little bit too hard, too structured, too almost military. Um, but um, after a while, it turned out to be positive because for example, we set up uh, fixed check-in and check-out times when, I, when everybody would be in the same uh, call just to say, hey, how was your day? Oh, today I did this or today I did that, et cetera. Um, before the remote work era, that usually that happened organically. People would meet at the elevator and hey, was would ask how was your day, and people would tell them how the day was and what they did, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no such opportunity anymore. So mm -hmm. we uh, we had to create that um, a structured way um, that worked very well. Um, and now what we're we're finding is that um, we need to create. To, to extend that, that reasoning into more social interactions, for example. We have, um, uh, we have happy hours or we have uh, uh, um, informal moments. We have gaming nights. People play multiplayer games uh, remotely with their colleagues from the teams. Because you know, at, at the end of the day, the, the person that you're working with can't be just a face on a Zoom screen, right? They, they need to be somebody that you have some level of connection with. And, um, and and we're working hard to build that connection. Mm, okay, <laughs> that's very clear. Thank you. So, uh, um, Lucas, coming back to the, yes, the fundraising uh, of your fundraising experience, because now you, you got a lot of experience on this. Uh, can you give us, can you give to our startup some suggestion when uh, they have to start the, their first round table and so uh, what are, according to you, some good tips for ha for them to, because as you know, it's a very, very tough period. Yeah, it is difficult. It's not fun. Uh, you have to do it. You will do this more often than you think you will. Uh, at some point, you will not stop doing it. I think that that's something very, uh, that I wish I had known in the past. The, even though you're not fundraising after a few rounds, 
you will have to speak to investors regularly. And I guess that that's one of the first tips that I would give. Um, um, I would say that investors don't invest in a snapshot. They invest in a movie. So they need to know your story. They, you can't meet, show up someday and say, hey, my name is Lucas. I would like $2 million. So I don't know how much. Um, that doesn't work like that. So you need to, before you start fundraising, you need to introduce yourselves to investors. You need them to know your story. You need to know what you're working on and let them ask you about fundraising. Uh, and it might be that for the first few years your, or a few months, your answer will be, look, we're not fundraising right now. We're just, we just wanted to keep you updated uh, because at some point we will be fundraising. And I wanted to hear mm -hmm. your, your thoughts about, uh, mm -hmm. about us. And that's a very good opportunity for you to capture feedback on, uh, on your product, on your team, maybe your strategy. Um, and then you can build uh, in your mind a perception of what the market thinks about you. Uh, because at the end of the day, during fundraising, that will be important. Um, and uh, so the way it might change the way you present yourself, it might change the way you present your numbers, um, because you might find that the market cares about different things than you do. But you will not have an opportunity to adapt that if you don't, uh, if you just show up uh, to investors at the time of fundraising, you need to update them regularly. So uh, at Ravello, every three months, um, we send out uh, uh, investor updates that you know, have some uh, detailed information about how the company's doing, what progress we've made, what milestones, what key numbers, not deep. I mean, they're not down to the operating level, but, you know, something that reminds the investors that one, we exist because sometimes they forget, uh, two, that we are doing well, uh, and three, that yes, we have problems and we are working to solve these problems. The good investors are the ones that care about how you tackle the problems. The bad investors are the ones that look at problems that you have and say, ah, oh, that person has problems. I don't want to invest. So mm -hmm. because the fact is that every startup, every industry has those problems and it only matters how, um, how, uh, how, how the entrepreneur is tackling that. So I think, I think that that's one, that's one tip that I would give. Um, the second is um, I would work the introductions strategically. So it's very hard for you to just send a cold email to an investor and say, hey, my name is Lucas. I'm starting Ravello. I want to talk to you. That email will probably not get an answer, right? So um, it takes some time for you to find a common connection to an investor, a common connection that one, the investor respects and a uh, connection that likes you. Because if you have somebody who doesn't like you, that person won't make the introduction. But if you have somebody that likes you and that investor respects, you should ask that person to make the introduction because it's, it will be coming from somebody they trust. Um, and that's very, uh, uh, that's very important. Um, I see uh, very often that uh, um, uh, early stage entrepreneurs will just write cold emails to, uh, to, our, to, to venture capital investors and they will never get a response. So I think that working the introductions, introductions strategically is, and sometimes you have multiple avenues. You have like three different people that could make the introduction. Uh, and those three people could, uh, yes, make the introduction at the same time, because that might uh, create the perception with, uh, with the investor that, um, look, everybody's talking about these people. Everybody's talking about that guy. So that, and that's a good thing. So um, uh, I think those are the two, the, the two key tips that I would give to somebody who is uh, starting uh, with, uh, with fundraising. Mm -hmm. Many thanks for advice. It's very interesting. Yeah. So a net network is very, uh, very important. <laughs> um, well, you would say it, ask, ask, ask to everybody for introduction when you are going to raise funds. This is your, uh, your suggestion, Lucas. Because... Uh, yeah, I think the suggestion is never go direct. Mm -hmm. Like you only go direct if you already have had a, a relationship with that investor in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I you just ask for an introduction, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, um, we have time for some two, two, two more questions. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, we have time. And yes. I, would have to, I take a, um, the opportunity to, to ask um, Lucas if you want to share with us the best moments in your career. Wow, <laughs> the best moment in my career. Um, 
Look, I think that, um, yeah, I know. I know what the best moment in my career was. The best moment in my career was when um, we started this program um, at Ravello called the New Partners Program, um, in which we would, we, we, we started uh, looking at our uh, existing employees um, and taking the best ones um, and giving them stock options, right? Uh, and it didn't matter their seniority. They could be interns, they could be junior analysts, but we created this program in which their managers would create an application. They would apply for a position. They would write an application sent to us and then we would approve. Uh, and then um, we had meetings with these employees to tell them that they had been approved, that they were becoming a partner of Ravello. And some of them cried and a lot of them were happy and a lot of them were you know, just telling their friends, telling their moms that yeah, I became a partner, et cetera. And I think that, that that made me happy because a few years ago, that company didn't exist. A few years ago, that company was just an idea. And now there's somebody who's telling their mom that they're happy and they're crying because they are a partner in that company that didn't exist. You know, we just created it. And, and, and that was great because it's, um, it, it, it showed um, that we're building something that matters. We're not just building this for, for profit. We're, we're building this for, uh, to last. We're building something that you know, has value to uh, more people than just us. Uh, and I think that that, I, I know that what I just said, said sounds very basic, but that's the spirit of being an entrepreneur. If you build something just for the profit, you're a business person. Like if you're an entrepreneur, you're building something to last and you're building something that has value for other people as well. Other, other than you. And that day was a day that I got a very solid, uh, palpable feeling that uh, this was the case. Yeah. Very, very nice story. Thank you, Lucas. And I also have another question for you that I think can help very much our um, early stage startup. If you can share with, with us, for example, a, moment, a very difficult moment in your career uh, as entrepreneur and how did you overcome this difficulty? How did you find uh, the, the, the willingness to, to continue your career as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think, I think the most difficult uh, moment in my career was uh, as an entrepreneur was when I during one of our rounds of fundraising, we pitched a lot of people and everybody said no. Um, and, and I mean, I, we didn't pitch five people. We pitched, I think 74 different uh, venture funds. Uh, a lot of them didn't reply. A lot of them said, uh, no thanks, we don't invest in Latin America or no thanks, we don't invest in, uh, in job platforms. Um, there were always uh, some reason for them not to, to invest. And some of them looked at the opportunity very deeply and then said no. Um, that was very difficult because it's almost the opposite of the example I just gave about you know uh, uh, somebody being happy because of what I built, of what we are building. This is nobody believing in what we are building. Or that, at least that was the, the feeling that I had, that nobody was believing in what we were building. And, and that was, uh, that was brutal. That was, I was, I was very, very sad at that point. Um, you know, my, um, I was in a bad mood for weeks. Um, my wife noticed that she said, I, I don't think that uh, we had such a tough time as a couple, um, uh, uh, such as that time. Um, and I think the way we overcame it was just persistence, persistence, persistence. Eventually what happened was that one of those no's became a yes, because we just kept um, insisting and it's not insisting like, hey, invest in us, invest in us. No, no, no. Uh, we, we waited for a little while and they said, look at some more positive results. We'll keep you updated. Look at some more positive results. We'll keep you updated. This is the new initiative that we're building. And when we show that new initiative, uh, they said, oh, I like that. I want to invest in that. So something, uh, um, it's always possible for if you persist for, for long enough. 
Um, but I won't say that it was easy because when no nobody believes in your idea, it means that eventually you will have to fire people. You will have to shut the business down. You will have to stop paying your bills. Um, and all those things happened. Like we, we planned for all those things, sorry. Uh, uh, we had the list of people that we would fire. Uh, we knew that the, who were the suppliers that we were going to default on. Uh, and and um, we didn't have to do it. Uh, but the fact that I spent so much time thinking about that, about that defeat scenario uh, made it very difficult. I would like to mention another point in my career that was very difficult was when the COVID pandemic hit, um, our business was deeply affected. As you can imagine, we're a jobs company. Uh, a lot of companies were laying off, a lot of startups were laying off professionals. Uh, nobody had the confidence to keep investing and growing their teams. And I'm talking about the first two or three months uh, after March, uh, 2020. Um, we had to lay off 30% of our payroll. Uh, to reduce costs and extend our runway. Um, it was very difficult to do that. And because I knew I was firing some great people, some very, very competent people. I was not firing people because of performance. If I had uh, any alternative, I would not have fired them. I would have kept them. I would have retained them. I had worked hard to hire them, to retain them. And now I had to fire them. Um, and but it was unavoidable. It was very, very difficult to avoid any of that because we didn't know what the what the capital markets would look like, what the job markets would look at look like in in um, in in, in uh, several months or years time. Like if we knew that it would all be okay like it is today, we probably would not have made that decision. Uh, but given what we knew at the time, it was the right uh, decision, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Lucas, for this meaningful uh, experience. And uh, I think, Mathilde, if you want, we have um, a room for another question. So if you want to ask. Um, okay. Yes. Um, uh, uh, maybe if you have time, you know, uh, which entrepreneurs have inspired you uh, particularly or particularly? Um, could you tell about a little, and, uh, except about, uh, you know, mentors, but an entrepreneur that you talk about, you think about? Mm, Would it be a, a very good question. Inspiration for you, be a um, strong inspiration for you? Uh, um, I, don't, I don't have many of those. I wish I had a name that was clearly uh, coming to mind um, because uh, uh, as another entrepreneur, but I like, um, I like uh, uh, some of the, I like the founder of, of um, Duolingo. I don't know if you know that platform, but it's Duolingo is a platform to learn languages and, uh, uh, and I'm a big fan of languages. Um, uh, and I think that Duolingo has um, a very interesting thought process mm -hmm. linked to its foundation. So it was something that was born as uh, for, I don't know if you know that, but the founder of Duolingo is the same person who founded CAPTCHA, that, um, that thing that you use to type different words uh, when you want to authenticate, you have an image that looks like jambled uh, words and you have to type it and, and clear the code. Um, Duolingo was found, founded as a way for humans to help machines learn how to translate. So uh, the fact that people learned languages with that was just a side effect. Uh, of what they were building, and that was, I think that that's beautiful. They were trying, try they could, they were, they were tackling two problems at the same, the same time and solving mm -hmm. them. Um, and after a while, and they never stopped. Uh, I like the fact that they found other problems to solve. Um, today, Duolingo offers a competitor uh, to TOEFL, uh, the, the English exam, um, that you can take using Duolingo, and it's something that you know, it, you would never have thought about it at the very early stages of the company because, and I like that as a model. Um, at Provello, we would never have guessed six years ago that today we would be doing um, student lending for, uh, for employees, for professionals. And yes, that's something that we're doing now because we know their employability, we know their salary. So we have a good idea what their credit score looks like and we're able to provide student lending for them 
when they're out of the, when they complete their studies, mm -hmm. they're better employees. So we actually have a higher chance of placing them in our uh, in our uh, clients. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that 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 that's an inspiration that we took from the Duolingo model. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, you have an, um, a question, Roberta, or we can conclude? There is a specific reason, uh, Lucas, uh, for the name of your company. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Revelo uh, in, in Portuguese and in Spanish, it means I reveal. It means that I, I, I showcase, I display, and that's what we want to do with the potential of uh, emerging market uh, professionals. We want to reveal that potential to the world uh, and mm -hmm. we want to reveal that potential to companies in the US and Europe. In Europe. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what's behind, uh, behind the name. Did you choose the name of uh, an investor choose the name for you? Because sometimes it happens. No, uh, we chose the name. Actually, it was not um, the name that we started the company with. Uh, we started the company with another name that nobody understood and everybody mistook the name. Um, and, and then three years later, we had to change it. Uh, and I always tell mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, don't waste too much time thinking about names and logos and registering your, your trademark. Because you know, chances are that in one or two years' time you'll have to change it, uh, and that's exactly what happened to us. So I think that's a good tip for everybody that's listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luca. And just to conclude, uh, if you have some word, uh, a message for the uh, the entrepreneur, uh, you know, in some words, to conclude uh, the the meeting. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so in I few would, words. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll say that. Um, uh, being an entrepreneur is not a higher calling. It's not more noble than other uh, professional paths. Um, but it's one that once you go uh, through it, um, you, if you like it, it will make you unemployable. It will be very hard for you to do anything else after you've started to enjoy becoming an entrepreneur. And what I say to, to, to people who aspire to become entrepreneurs is get ready because uh, emotionally ready because it's a journey with highs and lows and the highs are very high and the lows are very low. And mm -hmm. probably when you're in a low, it feels worse than it actually is. And when you're in a high, it feels better than it actually is. So you, lead, you need to, to learn how to calibrate your, your emotions and your uh, reactions uh, to uh, the different outcomes that you have. Right. <laughs> okay. But never give up. Yeah. Yeah. Never, mm -hmm. never, ever, 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 ever give up. <laughs> thank you for the message. Very nice message. Lucas, um, thank you very much for your participation. Of course, if you uh, are in Paris, we, we, we will be very, very glad to have you here at the incubator. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. As soon as the borders open again and we're able to fly uh, yeah. into Europe and the US, uh, I guess I'll be, I'll be uh, accumulating a lot of miles with the, uh, the airline. All right. So we have to conclude, unfortunately. The, the, and um, for a chance, we will have a replay of this uh, meeting. So you will uh, find it in, uh, in some days, uh, quite very soon, in the uh, social uh, network. And uh, the next meeting and the next uh, CEO talk, international CEO talk, uh, will be on September. And we can give you the date on the 7th of September. We, but we cannot give you the location. So you have to be uh, very curious on our uh, website and any uh, any social networks. <laughs> so many thanks for you, uh, Luca, Roberta, and the audience. And uh, we will be happy to, to meet you again. And have a nice Thank holiday. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.